This is One on One. Mark Mappin is the author of a fascinating book called uh, Prohibition Gangsters, The Rise and Fall of a Bad Generation. Good to see you, Mark. Thank you, Steve. Good to see you. One of my favorite books, one of my uh, fascinating uh, topics that I'm fascinated by. Hey, listen, so anyone could write a book about gangsters. We've had other mm -hmm. people on talk about yeah. mobsters, gangsters. Um, but here's the thing. You make the connection between Prohibition, which lasted for... 13 years. 13 years. And the rise and fall of some of these characters that include Lucky Luciano, right. uh, Al Capone, Willie Moretti, uh, Longies Woman, yeah. otherwise known as Gangster Number 2 over in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Some people don't know that name. Yeah. What is the connection between Prohibition and these guys? These okay. pretty bad guys. They're all part of the same generation. These guys were all immigrants, or the sons of immigrants. Mm. Uh, and they were mostly Italians and Jews who came to this country in great numbers um, in the late uh, 1800s. And these guys were basically all born at some point between about <clears throat> around, uh, um, 1880 and 1905, 25 years. So they're all the same age. And they're all immigrants. They're living in the, in the Lower East Side and other uh, rundown parts of town. Right here in New York City. Well, there's New York City, but Boston had its own version, and Cleveland and uh, cities across the country, uh, where they had a large immigrant ghetto. They had these young men who were looking for some way to get out of the ghetto, some way to become a success. And then, by an amazing coincidence, along came Prohibition. And the United States government uh, uh, ruled. That, there it is. So the government uh, yes. says you can't drink liquor legally anymore. That's right. And in effect, what they were doing was they were handing one of America's biggest industries, the liquor industry, over to this generation of gangsters. Dumb uh, move. A dumb move. Not for the gangsters. This was the greatest <laughs> thing. It was a dumb happened. move for the country and for the government. It really was. And it took them 13 years to realize what a dumb move it was. So people like Al Capone, who were yeah. born and raised here in the New York City area, right? He goes out to Chicago. Yeah. And he goes, wait a minute. Look at the opportunities out here in Chicago. He hooks up with? Johnny Torrio. Johnny Torrio, who later that, that didn't turn out so well. Mm -hmm. But he goes out there, and all of a sudden, huge opportunity out there. That's You've got Longies Wilman, who becomes a bootlegger over in New Jersey. Right. He started as a, as a fruit salesman, right, and a waiter. And he jumped on the prohibition opportunity. You know, he realized there were some who realized, they weren't so stupid, they realized that this was, was a fantastic opportunity. Did the government, let me ask you something. Yeah. Did the government realize, did the federal government realize when they did this, mm -hmm. we're gonna ban alcohol, it's gonna make it Ill illegal. Yeah. Did they realize that they would help some of these people, including Lucky Luciano, yeah. organize People use the term organized crime as if it was organized from the beginning. It was not. It was not. Did they realize that in many ways they were helping disorganized crime become organized and change the face of crime in this country? That's right. Crime was really a small stakes affair. It was thuggery. You know, you would rob somebody, beat them up, blackmail them. Uh, but then along came prohibition, and all of these gangs became much more sophisticated because they needed bail bondsmen and chemists to brew the liquor. And cops to and look the other way. That's exactly right. And juries to look the other way, and prosecutors to look the other way. And uh, so these gangs became much more complex operations than they had been before Prohibition, uh, thanks to the United States government. I'm fascinated by this because uh, Al Capone is, uh, is not just an interesting char character because people know his name, and, uh, and um, Robert De Niro played Al Capone in the movie, yeah. right? And they, they see the scene with the baseball bat when everyone's sitting around, but Al Capone was more interesting than just his violent nature. Because Al Capone wasn't very sophisticated, but he did in fact go out there to Chicago, mm -hmm. build an empire with Johnny Torrio, took the operation away from Johnny Torrio, if I'm not mistaken, right? right. That's correct. But had, it's interesting, he became organized and sophisticated, but still at the heart was a thug yes, and violent and had to do the violence himself. Was he atypical for most gangsters who had to be the one or would they back away like people like Frank Costello mm -hmm. here in New York who was never violent himself? By the way, show the picture of Frank Costello. His hands are definitely not dirty, trust me. <laughs> he, would, he, he thought he was actually a businessman, yes. right? Yes. Big difference between Al, Al Capone and Frank Costello. Yeah. 
So the question is, how, how violent were they? Well, well, they're all different. They are, exactly. Different personalities and uh, some were mild, like Johnny Torrio, who believed in treaties and working out... He was a businessman. Whereas Al Capone uh, was a little more inclined to kill the people who got in his way, uh, notably in the St. Valentine's Day massacre, where there was a rival gang. He wanted to get them out of the way. So he didn't do it himself. He stayed in his home in Miami, but uh, he organized the, uh, the rub out of those those rival gangsters. It's so interesting because years later, even though it's not in the book, John Gotti, mm -hmm. who many people believe was actually very much involved in the murder of Paul Castellano mm -hmm. uh, at Spark State House, Steakhouse, Steakhouse over on the east side, they believe he was actually in one of the cars watching it happen, meaning some people, yeah. Yeah. while they got sophisticated and organized, still wanted to be around when that stuff was happening. Yeah, you know, a lot of it is, um Exaggerated, I think. Newspaper men were always looking for a story so they'd embellish something. And um, uh, but in the case of Al Capone, yeah, he was a vicious guy. Some say it was because he had um, syphilis and it had eaten mm. away parts of his brain and made him uh, aggressive. Mm. Uh, there's something to that. But then there were smart guys like Luciano. Lucky Luciano, Charles Lucky Luciano. Well, Lucky Luciano from Sicily. He was from Sicily, which helped him a lot uh, getting involved in organized crime because some of these mafia organizations would only take somebody from Sicily or only from uh, Naples, and they would refuse to have Jews in their organization. But Luciano was smarter than that, and he assembled a uh, gang in the 20s that included Sicilians and Neapolitans and Jews, uh, much to the dismay of the mafia bosses, but this is something that uh, Luciano wanted to do. And it, I, I uh, like the concept that Luciano believed in diversity <laughs> in this organization, <laughs> very trendy. And he was uh, intelligent. He could talk to people uh, way above his social class. He could ingratiate himself with them. With them. And he was a good organizer. Hmm. Um, they finally got him um, for uh, prostitution Yes, you know, for promoting prostitution. For, yes, for running the prostitution racket. In but New not York. actually. It's interesting. Some of these guys never actually interacted with prostitutes. They just ran houses of prostitution. Well, it was a business. They had many businesses like uh, gambling and uh, bootlegging and uh, extortion, and uh, you know, prostitution was one of them. Real quick, Nucky Johnson, who, um, for those who are fans of Boardwalk Empire like myself, Nucky Thompson is the yeah. name that they use. Right. Right. Was a guy who was not in the mob, was not considered a mobster by many because he had a government role. That's right. But prohibition was a huge part of his success. Yeah. Well, he, he was the um, a, a principal politician in Atlantic City. And in Atlantic City, they made money from the tourists. And the reason the tourists came to Atlantic City as somebody once said, was not to read Bibles. If they want to read Bibles, we'd do that. But they were there for the brew, the, the booze, the broads, and um, the gambling. Yes. That's why they came there. And Nucky, who was an intelligent community leader, he made sure that those um, attractions flourished in Atlantic City. And he needed the government officials to make sure that they would, in fact, look the other way. That's right. By the way, here's the worst yeah. part of it. Not worst, it's just yeah. the way it played out. It's the rise and fall. Every one of them fell. Yeah. Because? Uh, because of the Great Depression. So they had made a lot of money, and, um, and they were planning uh, more to be more organized, and uh, they're planning for the future and working out treaties to stop all the uh, killing amongst them. And then the uh, country collapsed because of prohibition. And all of a sudden, these uh, bootleggers- No, because of the Depression. Because of the Depression, yeah. Because of the Depression, uh, people before that had admired these gangsters. They were sort of a Robin Hood attitude. These guys are supplying me with what I want, alcohol. But with the Depression, uh, all of this is not so glamorous anymore. And that's when you start to see gangsters vilified in movies like Public Enemy and Scarface. Um, and Elliot Ness becomes somebody who we admire going after them. Yes, although his role was really quite exaggerated.
How dare you say Hollywood does that? Well, they do, and they did it with J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover, who didn't want to yeah. have anything to do with And by the way, one of the characters here, Thomas Dewey, uh, was a crime fighter here in New York. He's a big part of that in the book here. Listen, let me plug it one more time. The book is called Prohibition Gangsters, The Rise and Fall of a Bad, a Very Bad Generation by Dr. Mark Mappin. Great stuff. I've been wanting to have you in here for a long time. Steve, I love this book. Thank, thank you, Thank you. Okay. Great Good stuff. Talking to you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. Funding has been provided by Barnabas Health, Berkeley College, the law firm of Gibbons PC, United Water, Wells Fargo, Verizon Communications, and by New Jersey Natural Gas. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been made possible in part by the Adler Aphasia Center.